nice to see everybody. Um, thank you for coming to today's session. Um, essentially, what we'll be looking at today is um, we'll do a quick round of introductions um, and um, then we will have a look at the area profile reports. Um, we'll look at the sort of data that you can see in them to start with, and then we'll have um, uh, an exploration of the two reports that, that cover the areas we're looking at today. Um, and then we'll have a look at audience spectrum segmentation, which some of you may be familiar with, um, but because it's one of the um, one of the useful data sets that you can find in the area profile reports, we thought it was worth spending a bit of time looking at that and looking at the groups which may be particularly relevant to you in your areas. Um, and then um, at the end of the slide set, there's a whole lot of uh, sources and resources for things that you might find useful following on from this session. Um, as, um, as Sarah said, please do raise questions as we go through or we can have a, a, a bit of a Q&A at the end of the session. Um, um, it is a, a relatively informal, so please do, you know, if you need to get up and go away at any point, that's absolutely fine. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so that's, that's it for today. Um, just a quick introduction to the audience agency to start with. Um, so this is us and I'm part of the consultancy team. So we have a consultancy research, learning and participation and our audience finder platform support team. Um, and prior to the uh, prior to the pandemic, I was based in the London office. Um, I'm now mainly working from home in Folkestone um, and the work that I do is largely with um, organisations with a with a visitor offer, so museums, galleries, heritage sites, um, and libraries. Um, although um, the audience agency, you know, we work across a lot of different art forms um, and you know different sizes of organisation, different governances, um, you know, so so lots of different work across the arts and cultural sector. And um, before coming to the audience agency, I was a public engagement manager for um, a heritage visitor attraction up in Manchester. Um, so that's a, a quick introduction to me. Um, and in terms of what we're sort of looking at at the moment, um, all organisations have a lot of different needs and questions at the moment. Um, and in many cases, these are likely to be quite different from what you were looking at pre-pandemic. <laughs> so we're aware that there are some burning questions that have emerged as a result of the challenges that you've been facing over the last 18 months. Um, and these are some of the examples of questions that we've been coming across that have cropped up um, perhaps more frequently or with more urgency um, recently than, than they were previously. So um, looking at uh, physical and digital audiences, how they relate to one another and, you know, what sort of strategies you need to put in place for each type of audience. Where are the opportunities um, for your organisations to perhaps, you know, explore new revenue streams because we do know that museums in particular have been hard hit by the pandemic in terms of a reduction in income um, through perhaps secondary spend um, if you've got shops and cafes on site for example um, and perhaps you know most relevant to the session that we're looking at today is how can you reach the people in your local communities who perhaps um, you weren't seeing pre-pandemic but there's an opportunity now people aren't traveling as far as they were they may be looking more in their local area for opportunities um, to engage with with arts and culture um, so those are the things that, that we've been seeing but what i would like to hear from you are um, what are your burning questions um, what's been coming up in discussions in your organisations? What are the sorts of things that, that you want to be able to, um, to answer? So if we could very briefly go around everybody and you could um, introduce yourself and, and perhaps just flag up one uh, question which has become very important to your organisation. Hi. Hi, um, it's hard to name one thing, <laughs> as Sarah knows, um, because so I'm quite new. I'm the director um, and I've been in post for about three months um, and our pressing need is to fix the building. 
because um, a lot of um, the infrastructure is end of life, which does actually relate to audiences because we need a new CRM. Um, so I made a, an application recently to the um, CRF3 fund for a new CRM system. Um, but in terms of audiences, I, um, I, I think our primary challenge is actually reinventing ourselves because there are lots of um, fixed opinions in the local community as to what we are and who we are. Um, and in a way, I suffer from those. Um, so A, it's seen primarily as a destination for families. And B, because of um, the fact that we have an endowment and that we were set up by a very wealthy individual, the perception is that we don't actually need any support and that we have lots of wealthy patrons, which we don't. <laughs> um, so I'm actually, my strategy, uh, the advantage of being new is that um, I'm going to ignore all of that. <laughs> and um, based on really good practice that I've seen in national museums around the country that are doing amazing community programs, I'm just going to go out there and um, engage a whole different community. And I'm doing that because I've got, um, we had huge cuts in staff last year. I'm going to do it through partnership. Um, so, for instance, I've signed a um, partnership agreement with um, um, River Time, who do boat trips for kids with autism. And we're going to do more. And they're, 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 they do an amazing um, programme of activities on the water. Um, so I'm, I'm going to focus on activities on and around the water um, for kids and young people with learning difficulties. Um, so the other partner that I'm talking to is, um, is actually based in East London, Simon Goody, who runs, um, um, he actually is heavily involved with Paralympics and he got involved in um, setting up um, activities on the water for kids with disabilities. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm building partnership locally to, 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 to make what we offer much more practical for families and kids with difficulties, not just the well-off. So that's a bit rambling. Thank you. No, that's good. Thank you. Now I've joined late, so I don't know who else is on the call. <laughs> um, so um, who else is on the call? Steve Gardham. I don't know where Steve is from. Hi, I'm from the Roald Dahl Museum. Oh, fantastic. Hi, Steve. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, so, oh. <laughs> uh, like Catherine, um, there's sort of too many things to talk about. I think, you know, <laughs> like a lot of museums, we're interested in diversifying our audience. It's something that we've done surprisingly little of, I think, at the, the Royal Bell Museum, because we, before COVID, um, we've just been busy doing our day job. You know, we've had up to 60,000 visitors a year, some years even more than that and 12,000 school children. Um, what we've been doing whilst we've been mostly shut for the last better part of two years, or 18 months anyway, is um, we've been developing a, an online learning offer, which again is not particularly surprising, but for, for our museum with a potentially widespread popular appeal, it's a really exciting opportunity. We hadn't done online learning before because I think you know everybody's familiar with the sector knows that a lot of online learning has been given away for free. And as an independent museum, we can't afford to do that. Why would we prioritize it? Um, and we couldn't do a big dig digitization of our collection because we don't even own the copyright in our collection. It has commercial value, obviously. Um, and so that wasn't that wasn't a route we ever went down. So we're busy doing our day job welcoming schools on site, which we're happily doing again. Um, but we have now because of this, because of like the, you know, the, the you know, the adoption, the widespread adoption of video communications and the delivery of professional services through them like a lot of museums we've realized we can actually deliver a sustainable schools um program online so that's what we've been working on and we're starting to get the word out on that and the interesting thing for us is that the the audience for that is potentially global i mean that's mm -hmm. a grand thing to say and we're a long way off achieving that because mm -hmm. spreading the word is hard when your marketing budgets are so limited but um but that's that's exciting for us we are interested in doing more stuff with local communities we know that's got to be part of our future but we're you know we're we haven't really started and i think part of that is because we're really not sure how long it's going to take to recover our audiences and therefore what are the implications will we have to 
as Catherine referred to at the River and Rowing Museum, lose a lot of staff. You know, what does that do in terms of making the road to recovery longer and harder? It's like a lot of people, we know we're, we're trying to walk that balance beam. We're trying not to cut too hard and too soon because that seems self-defeating. But equally, we, we don't know how the next 6, 12, 18 months are going to go. Um, so that's challenging. What I think we are particularly interested in in the short term is, as you would expect, we're a, a museum visited by families. So um, most most of our visitors, almost all our visitors come in just all the days that are weekends and holiday days in the year. So what we're trying to do is we're, we're open for schools in the week. So staff are here. It's not like people couldn't visit, but people don't visit. So what we're trying to do is limit our opening hours to, to, to Thursday through Sunday. And we're trying to generate more of a local audience on Thursdays and Fridays. And we think logically the audiences that we might develop are parents of early years children so kids are not yet in school um and adults adults interested in not just in Roald Dahl or, or creativity but also interested in a walk in the Chilton Hills that kind of thing so but we don't really have a track record in attracting those audiences in any great numbers so that's something I think we're particularly interested in right now all the stuff around you know people um audiences with special educational needs and things like that yeah, like everybody, we think that's important that we want to do more of that too. But I think it's those, you know, general visiting audiences that can actually visit in the week. Mm. That's something that I'm specifically interested in today. Mm. Sure. Lovely. Thanks, Steve. Would you like to nominate the next person? Sorry. <laughs> uh, Anna. Uh, hi there, I'm Anna from uh, Hapstow House Preservation Trust um, and we we always suffer with the fact that we're one of several people on the site and we're the least best known. Um, so we're part of Stowe School because we're in the main mansion, we own the main mansion and we restore it and then we lease it back to the school. But we're also within the National Trust Stowe Gardens. So, you know, who who are we? Who, who they don't, No one knows who we are and then once you're in the gardens, you have to pay more to come to the house. So people don't want to do that because most of the people are National Trust visitors. Um, equally, people don't realise we're open because we're a school. So really, when you say what type of visitors, we kind of want any visitors, really. Um, we're, it's, it's really each time we start again, you know, COVID has made us go back to zero again. Um, so we we have all these aspirations the type of visitors we want and we have been working towards it but we're up to a point now where we just kind of want any visitors um so it's yeah that's that's basically all i have to say because we're like almost starting again great thanks anna oh do you want to uh, sorry yeah sorry i should have said uh liz Good morning, everyone. Um, so I am Liz. I'm from Milton Keynes Museum. Um, I'm recently in post, so I've been here about two months uh, as head of development. So it's the first time we've had a, an in-house fundraiser. So it's all new to everybody. Um, and uh, so I am kind of pulling together all the different strands of work that we're working on at the moment and future projects and uh, coming up with a plan to uh, fundraise for all of the ambitions that we've got at the moment. We've got two glorious new galleries, which I need to get the money to fill. One which will tell the story of ancient Milk Keynes, so uh, from prehistory through to the 1800s. Um, and then uh, the new gallery, which will tell the story of the new town and the development of the new town um, in the late 60s, uh, right up to the present day and to uh, the community uh, that live here today. So um, Milton Keynes has got a really diverse community. Um, more so than most places in the country um, so we've got a fabulous audience and prior to the pandemic we were just nudging up to 60,000 visitors a year which uh, felt really good and uh, the plan is to build that to 100,000 visitors um, over the next five years um, so things that are important for me at the moment is really getting the evidence behind our audience profile uh, our potential audience profile, understanding who, who, who is coming and who is not coming to our museum, and we don't have the solid evidence to back that up. We 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 know what we think, um, but I but as a fundraiser, I need the evidence to to back up the anecdotal 
um, so I can prove to funders that, that, that uh, their money will be well used. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I want to understand our audience. I want to uh, find ways to reach out to, uh, to communities that we're not reaching at the moment so that our audience is actually reflecting the, 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 the makeup of the, of the community um, because we are the Milton Keynes Museum. So, so we need to be able to reflect that. Um, and I think others have also said that I'm looking to build audiences on days when not many, many people come. So of the 60,000 visitors that we had in 2019, uh, 20, nearly 25,000 of those were on event days, which is a big chunk. Um, and then, so how do, I'm looking at how we build our groups offer, how we build our schools offer, um, how we reach out to, to people who might benefit from coming on, to, on a quieter day. Um, and so we can sort of, you know, to, to maximise that as well. So uh, I'd like to know everything about everything, please. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. <laughs> um, who has not spoken yet? Uh, Tina, you're up. Hello. I don't. Can you hear me and see me? All right, because I'm on my mobile. You can. Good. Okay. Um, so I'm from the river. Um, I'm at, um, sorry, I've got so many jobs at the moment, it's a bit confusing. So my hat that I have on today is at the Vale and Town Museum. Um, and I'm a collections assistant there. Um, it's sort of a fairly new thing for me to be looking at. So similar to you, Liz, I want to know everything about everything, really. Um, it's about making sure we understand who our audiences are and, and particularly what the potential audiences are that are out there because... Um, the anecdotal evidence of who people were coming in would suggest that they're they're not that diverse. So so trying to think who who is out there and and how we can target them really. Um, yeah. So back to basics for me really. And that's about it. Because um, I'm on my mobile, I can't see the list of participants. I'm afraid. So somebody else might have to pick who who else is remaining. Sorry. That's fine. Sarah, do you want to do the honours and? Absolutely. The last person on the list, I think, is Anne. Hello, um, I'm Anne Middleton from Didcot Railway Centre, which is the Living Museum of the Great Western Railway. Um, the, um, we actually got involved with the audience agency many, many years ago through a Thames Valley Museum project. And interestingly enough, Road Dahl Museum was involved in that as well. And of the six museums in that project, both us and Rodal had a nationwide profile rather than a local profile. So it's really interesting to sort of see, <laughs> see how things have developed. Um, we've, uh, I've changed roles and then I've, I'm now back in this kind of role. So really the, I, what I'd like to do is to sort of catch up again. Um, before I got this invitation, I'd already recommended that we do a that we run another audience agency profile of our visitors. Um, so we may well be doing that. One of, although, I mean, uh, yeah, our visitors reduced during COVID, obviously, and um, who knows what's going to happen next year. But when I do my very simplistic analysis using free ge you know, geographical software on, on postcodes, we don't have a large local audience. Didcot is a hugely growing town. I've just given permission for another 15,000 new houses, young families. So to me, that looks our, our perfect audience. But are they visiting? And I don't think they are. Um, the other thing is we have... Um, We've re just restarted using Visitor Verdict, which is the Association of Independent Museums survey. And it will be really interesting. So we're now getting information about our current audience and it will be really interesting to know how that fits with the local community and how we can take that forward. Um, so again, I mean, like um, uh, la, la, la. <laughs> Liz, um, we have only been running busy days this year, and we're just looking at whether we go back to opening, you know, uh, 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 on a
on a wider range of days when we're not going to be so busy and whether it's worth doing that, what kind of audiences we can attract on, on those days. Um, so that's broadly it. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Um, and that's all that's all great and i think there's some there's some sort of common issues there which um the data that sits in the um engagement area profile reports should um help you sort of build some understanding particularly around those local communities so literally as this this session is titled you know who's sitting on your doorstep because what we have seen um as one of the main impacts um, of the pandemic um, at this point, in addition to the, the sort of growth of digital audiences that, that Steve was, was mentioning, um, is this idea that people aren't venturing as far as they were before. So organisations that were perhaps more reliant on the UK um, domestic tourism um, to, to bring in a large proportion of their visitors and even more so for, for museums and, and attractions that were reliant on an international um, tourism trade. Um, they are seeing, you know, new opportunities in their local communities that perhaps, you know, in the day to day of, you know, having um, a high footfall pre-pandemic um, wasn't really essential to look at those local audiences unless through some you know very particular community engagement programs so thinking about who's sitting on your doorstep as a as part of your regular day-to-day -day, um, visitor I think is is you know, quite a quite a significant change for some organisations, um, and it's certainly something that the the area profile reports can help with, and also that idea of you know having different strategies for different um, types of visitor and thinking about how how you might engage. Uh, people differently um, is also something that can be helpful because you can look at the different types of, of people who are in your area, what might be appropriate for them, what might make your offer meaningful, what sort of routes to engagement there are with these with these different groups. So without further ado, we will move on to looking at the profile reports themselves. So um, I think it's worth saying that um, the investment that Southeast Museums Development have made in these area reports is quite significant. Um, these are our most detailed and comprehensive area profile um, resources. And there's a lot of data in each of these reports. And um, 10 have been commissioned overall, um, sitting across the Southeast region. So for those of you who sit on the borders of um, the area profile report, which appears to be most relevant to you, but you might be right on the edge of it. There are other reports that you will have access to, um, to see who's you know, just over the border. Um, as a tool, it's most useful when it's used in conjunction with other information. So um, a lot of you have been talking about, you know, looking at who your current um, visitors are. And I think that's where the um, area profile report really comes into its own because it allows you to look at the differences between um, what your local population looks like and who your visitors are. So you can spot the gaps um, and, and sort of get a sense of how representative your, your visitors are of those local populations. Um, it's also really important to use it in conjunction with what you already know of those local communities. So this will give you, you know, a, a good overview. It gives you a lot of detail about the demographic profiles and so on of the people living in your area. But within your organisations, you also hold a lot of um, knowledge about those local communities. So it's important to lay all of that up. Um, and use this as, as part of that um, sort of uh, body of evidence that you have. Um, the other thing is that if you do have um, developments going on in your area, so Anne was mentioning you have some housing developments going on, that within the, the very localised area of where those developments happen, um, you may see some quite significant changes in at that particular community, which may not be reflected in the area profile report because it is taken at a particular point in time. But in terms of the area as a whole, change happens quite slowly. Um, 
in terms of a whole population. So although there may be um, significant changes at a hyperlocal level, as a whole, um, the report remains you know, useful um, for a longer period of time. So just as a sort of uh, reassurance of that. Um, so let's have a look. So this is the data um, that is in uh, the area profile report. Essentially, it looks at the population within the catchment area covered by the report itself. And it looks at that population through a variety of different lenses. So there's demographics, which is drawn from census data. There's audience spectrum profiling, which is one of the things we'll look at in a bit more detail later. And there's also um, recent cultural um, activity, um, which is taken from the TGI target group index data, which is a sort of um, national panel survey um, that's conducted um, on a regular basis. Um, the catchment area, excuse me, is set in the context of a base population. And for all of your reports in, in the southeast, it's the southeast region. So that's the base population. Um, and um, in your EAPR, you can look at each of those metrics, so the demographics and the spectrum profiling and so on. Um, at a, a ward level. So that gives you a really detailed picture of your local audiences and beyond so that you can start to build up a, a, a strategy, a targeted approach to who you're going to engage, whether it's, you know, um, bringing people in from a little further away within the region, or whether it is looking at those people who are on your doorstep. Um, and these are the two EAPRs that we're looking at today. So one covers Milton Keynes and Buckinghamshire and the other covers Oxfordshire. But as I say, they do all link up across the, the region as a whole. So if you feel that you draw a significant um, uh, audience from you know, just outside of, of your particular area, then you can look at the other area of profile reports. So I'm going to start by sharing the uh, Milton Keynes and Buckinghamshire profile report. Hopefully you can all see that. I'll go to the first. I'm seeing thumbs up and nods. This is good. So um, it starts with, uh, and all the area profile reports, they're exactly the same in terms of their format. So it starts with the introduction, and this gives you the detail on what area is covered um, by the report, and also the breakdown of the different wards that it covers as well in the more granular detail. Um, you then have uh, a little bit of information about all of the, this is all of the data that sits inside that report. So as you can see, there's a lot of it. <laughs> um, so as I was saying, it, it it is worth spending a little bit of time exploring the report and, and really sort of getting to grips with which parts of the information are most relevant for you. And it might be that, you know, for different parts of your programming, different parts of your um, uh, planning, um, different bits of the information will be relevant. So, you know, you can you can refer to it and come back to it um, at, at different points in your planning. The first tab is the audience spectrum profile, which we will come back to and look at in more detail. But that essentially tells you what the um, what the profile of your area is. And this is where you can see the comparator to the, um, the southeast population base. Um, and the next tab is the TGI data. So this gives you um, an idea of what sort of level of attendance is happening um, in your in your area um, and there is a particular set of metrics around museums and heritage attendance which will likely be most relevant for you i would say that the tgi data although it's useful um, it's also it, it can be a little optimistic. Um, sometimes people, when they're asked, um, overestimate <laughs> just how engaged they've been. Um, so it's worth bearing that in mind and taking it in conjunction with the audience spectrum profiling, which is based on what people actually do, as opposed to what they say they do. Um, but it's still quite a useful indicator. 
Um, and then the next um, uh, set of information is around the demographics. Um, for each of the different sections, you have this summary at the top, which gives you the overall picture. It pulls out the key sort of um, findings from the population data um, in terms of you know, the sort of highest proportions of people who fall into particular uh, categories. And this goes through a lot of information. All of this is taken from census data. But as you can see, it does break it down um, to quite a detailed level. Um, and I think it's also important to always think about the count as well as the percentage. So for some areas, you may have a, it may look as though you have a very low proportion of people who fall into any particular group. But if it's important for you as an organisation to target and work with these groups, it's worth looking at how many people that actually represents within the population, because that can still be quite a significant number. So if you're thinking about community outreach, for example, you know, um, one percent may not seem like a lot but that's nearly eight thousand people that you might have the opportunity to engage with um, if you're looking at the the area as a whole so it's always worth bearing those two two things in mind when you're looking at these these tables the other part of the table is these is the indices and that is really the comparator between your catchment area and the population base if it's in, in red, that means it's over-indexing. There's a higher proportion of those people in your catchment than in the area, the, the population as a whole. If it's in blue, then it's under-indexing. So that means there are fewer um, in your area than others. And it does mean that when you're thinking about your programmings, you know, a number of you were, were saying, you know, you were thinking about targeting particular groups. You can see, um, how possible that's going to be within your local area. So it means that your planning um, can be really focused on the people who are sitting in your area, who you have the opportunity to work with, i.e., you know, when you're setting your objectives, you're not setting up things that won't be achievable for you um, or you might struggle um, to achieve. So you're not setting yourself up to fail from the start, which is always a bit dispiriting if you if you're targeting a particular group, but actually they don't exist in your catchment area. That makes it very hard um, to engage with them. So lots and lots of information there. Um, also, um, uh, information about um, health and disability, um, people in care um, and then we go through to the next tab, which is employment and qualifications. This gives you an idea of um, the social grade of people living in the area, um, which again can be helpful for targeting, you know, particular um, social responsibility or, or outreach type activities that you might be involved in. And again, can help you really understand who's in your area and what opportunities you have to engage with people. And again, lots of information there. So a lot of these questions like occupation type, um, this is what feeds into that NSSEC um, <coughs> grading, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so that's all of that. I'm sort of whizzing through this <coughs> just to give you an idea of just how much information is in there. And then we come down to uh, country of birth and language and religion. Um, so again, this can give you a, a really good idea of, you know, who's in the area. Um, and I think it can, it can help with some of those, you know, if you are thinking about doing a piece of work with a particular community, you can, again, see the, the level to which those people exist in your, in your local communities. And with the languages, um, you know, you can see if there are some dominant languages that you might need to think about in terms of any interpretation or work that you do that you might want to, you know, put it into more than one language if you want it to be really accessible to particular groups in your in your area. And then there's religion as well. Um, the household tab, which is the next one, can be particularly helpful um, for museums, many of whom have uh, family programmes. 
because it gives you an idea of the makeup of the household so you can understand whether an early years programme might be more relevant for the local people in your area than perhaps something that targets um, older children, you know, families with older children. And also the extent to which a family offer is, um, is relevant to you. Uh, Steve, you, you put your hand up. Sorry, you might have said this and I totally missed it and I apologise this. So how do we actually get to these reports? Because, I mean, what you're showing us is is really useful and it, it's it's all actually very easy to understand in, insofar as, you know, it's well laid out, really clear, all that kind of stuff. How do I get it? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Sorry, I might be jumping the gun. I might be no, jumping no, the gun. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Sarah, over to you for that one. Yeah, um, I don't know if we'll be putting these on our website or not, but anyone who's been on this course will get a copy of that. Um because we can provide that, it's no problem. <laughs> yes, so um, hours of joy for you to come <laughs> when you get access to the report. Um, so yes, so this is um, life stage and, and households and you can see it gives you a lot of detail on, you know, how many dependent children, what ages they are. So again, you can be really targeted about the type of programming that you do. Um, and how relevant that's going to be for the people in your in your area. So all sorts of information in there, some of which will not be relevant, but um, you know it's it's a, a matter of sort of going through and understanding exactly what it is um, that you need to find out. But having looked at all that, the particular strength of um, these um, engagement area profile reports is that they go down to a very granular level in terms of the wards. So if um, if you're looking at, um, I think, let's have a look at, let's pick one that looks. So along the top here, you can see this is the, um, the average over the, um, the catchment as a whole. And then when you look down at the ward level, you can see that there are significant differences in some wards. So, for example, although this particular segment, and again, we'll look at the segments in a bit, uh, commuter land culture buffs account for 24 percent, which is reasonably high in terms of the catchment as a whole. When you look at some of these areas, Austin Wood, um, for example, it's 94 percent. So that's, you know, obviously a really significant audience for that for that area. Whereas you look at other areas, um, Ashley Green, no, no community land culture buffs at all. Um, so it's it's really worth looking at who's in your super local area. Should we um, should we ask we, um, the team if they have any wards they'd like to look at? That's I, I was just going to do that. I was just going to pick on <laughs> central Milton Keynes. Um, oh, that's <laughs> a good one to pick. <laughs> simply because, um, as Liz mentioned, um, Milton Keynes is rather more diverse in lots of different ways than the um, the catchment as a whole. So we won't look at the segmentation in too much detail at the moment because we will look at that in more detail in a bit. But if we go to the demographics, let's scoot along. So um, I think in age was something that I spotted, there were quite significant differences here. So in these younger age groups, you've got much higher proportions in Milton Keynes than perhaps elsewhere. Um, so 14% of 25 to 29 year olds compared to 6% in the region as a whole. So all of these things will have an impact on um, your sort of programming that you do because there might be things that, that you would be able to do um, and reach a younger audience is that perhaps some of the areas where they have um, older age groups so the, the older population is is very low in the central Milton Keynes area um, and again quite significant differences in terms of um, ethnicity as well you've got higher proportions um, of people from um, Black African and Caribbean, Black British backgrounds, you know, that's that's a significant difference there. Um, so again, you might have more opportunity to engage with those types of communities than um, perhaps other people in, in the area. So it's really worth looking at this granular detail, as I say, and for both of these, so for all of the metrics that we looked at going through the plans, you have all of those at award level. So there's an awful lot of information in there. 
and you have the counts that sit alongside them. So as I say, it's always worth checking on the count just to make sure that um, although it's a low percentage, it might be a, you know, a significant number of people that you still have an opportunity to engage with. And also the, the reverse is true as well, of course, it, it might be a high proportion, but it might not actually represent that many people. Um, so you can be um, quite confident in your planning. Um, and also, if you're, you know, if you're using this information to apply for funding, for example, or something like that, um, you can be really clear about why you've chosen a particular group to focus on um, for the, as the, in terms of, you know, what you're applying for funding for, um, because you know that those people are there. Um, and if you do have an understanding of who your current audiences are, you also can say, you know, we know that people, these people are here in our local community, but we're not reaching at them at the moment. And that's the difference that the funding would make. It, you know, it would give you um, the opportunity to actually put things in place to, to engage with those people. So that is uh, Milton Keynes. Let's have a look at the other report. Um, we have a quick question in Ooh. the chat, Jackie. Um, yes. When was this data collected? Um, Jill was asking. Um, so the census data is from the 2011 census, which is the most recent data set that's available. Um, that's one of the reasons why the area profile reports have a, a three year life cycle, because um, at that point we will have the uh, results of the 2021 uh, census. Um, as I was saying, although at a, at a hyper local level, um, change can happen quite quickly. So, you know, the, the makeup of a particular street or a particular housing development can change quite rapidly. Um, the area as a whole does not change significantly um, over that period. So the, the data in it remains uh, relevant. The, the TGI data is collected on a regular basis, so it'll just be the latest data set that we have access to. Um, and the audience spectrum data um, is based on, um, and we'll look at the, the, the segmentation later, that's based on a number of different sources, um, some of which are um, sort of census and uh, the taking part survey, for example. Um, and uh, some of it is drawn from our audience finder platform, which is continuously collecting data. Um, so they are, you know, the, the data is um, as up to date as it can be at this point, um, but it remains relevant for, for a period of three years, really. And then you might want to think about refreshing them. But it's why it's important to layer it up with that local understanding that you have of any particular changes that have taken place um, in your, in your hyperlocal area. Does that answer the question? Is that all right, Jill? <laughs> Silence. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so this is the Oxfordshire area profile report and um, it's exactly the same as the other one, so I won't go through all of the, the detail in that. Um, we, one of the museums that we work with through the Audience Champions Programme is Banbury Museum. Um, and this was, you know, they are, they are a case in point of a town which sits right on the edge of a number of different um, areas. So, and actually some of the areas that are just outside here are actually more relevant to the Banbury population than perhaps some of the sort of more South Oxfordshire um, data. So. Um, that's why I say it's worth thinking about where you are um, and where the sort of majority of your audiences might be coming from, who you might draw from. Um, so if I just whiz through here, we can have a look again at the more detailed information. So does somebody want to give me a, a award to look at? So did cot. <laughs> did cot. Okay. So we have did cot northeast, did cot south, and did did cot west, which is interesting. Um, so let's have a look at those. So if we look at uh, this one first. Um, so let's have a look and see what that's saying. 
I'm going to skip past the segmentation at the moment. Let's have a look at some demographics. Do, do, do. Okay, so that's all looking relatively similar to the um, overall. Let's see if there are any particular differences there. Not in terms of age. Is that the sort of thing that you would expect? Well, interestingly yeah. enough, Didcot is is uh, is being sort of lauded in the press as the average town. So <laughs> like it. <laughs> It's living up to its reputation. <laughs> interesting, interesting. The, the, the thing is, when we look at the, um, when we start to look at the segmentation, which has this very particular um, viewpoint of looking at the population in terms of their propensity to engage with arts and culture rather than their demographics, um, you might start to see some differences there in these in these wards. So, um, yes, but it's interesting that it's <laughs> it looks to be fairly typical of the area as a whole. All of this is very, uh, very much aligned, isn't it? Let's have a look, see if we can find any differences. <laughs> Spot the difference between Didcot and the rest of the region. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. Nope. <laughs> Slightly lower proportions of uh, households with no dependent children in Didcot Northeast. <laughs> Fewer families in that area. Uh, Let's see. Health wise, you look pretty much the same. Uh, doo, doo, doo. Wow, social grade is more or less spot on. So I think we can say <laughs> Didcot is representative of <laughs> the, um, the Oxfordshire population as a whole. But I thought it was quite interesting. I thought the age was quite interesting in that there were higher proportions of younger and working age people in Didcot than there were older people. And I suppose in my head, I thought as an Oxfordshire town, it might have higher proportions of older people than younger people. So that, I thought that was quite interesting, actually. Yes, yeah, and that's just the sort of thing that it is, it's useful to look at on that more detailed level, um, because even within the same area of a town, and again, this is something that we saw in the Banbury profile, that you can have very significant differences even from one side of a town to another, which you will know as people living in those areas, um, you will know that different neighbourhoods have very different characteristics, so that's why it's useful to look at this, this um, a quite detailed view, but also bearing in mind where the opportunities might be to bring in people from slightly further away as well. So you can have this sort of layered approach to your engagement. And um, something we haven't mentioned, but we, we are running um, a number of um, audience development workshops, which look at some, some of these sort of strategic approaches. And one of the things that is common to all organisations is that, you know, everyone has different priorities to balance, whether that's, you know, financial, um, social outreach um, or, you know, your sort of curatorial um, and sector ambitions as well. And you can draw on different audiences to achieve those those different um, strategic goals. So you don't have to, you know, the fact that you're focusing on one particular group for a particular strand of activity doesn't mean that those other audiences are not of interest to you um, and are not important to you, but you can use different ways to engage with them. So your strategy is sort of building up different types of activity that you will do for those those different audiences. Um, any questions about the um, area profile reports at this point before we go in and look at the segmentation? Nope. What I will say, and I, I've said this to the other groups as well, that I am aware that this is a lot of information to throw at you in a relatively short space of time. So once you've had the opportunity to explore the report and think about what it means for you, um, 
I am here, please feel free to get in touch and ask any questions that arise from that closer investigation of, of the bits of the data that are most relevant to you. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that come up. Okay, so let's go back to Okay. Is everyone happy to carry on at this point? Um, if, if you need to sort of grab a comfort break or anything like that, please do. Otherwise, we'll just plough on. I'm seeing nodding heads. Good, good stuff. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the audience spectrum segmentation model, it is one of the key data sets in the area profile reports. So I think it's worth looking at it in, in a bit more detail. Um, I think some things to point out at the beginning are that um, segmentation as a process doesn't ignore the fact that we are all individuals. <laughs> so um, what it does is it looks for the things that we have in common within a particular context. So, you know, within the things that we like to do, for example, we have a lot in common with other people who like to do that sort of thing as well. Um, and this particular segmentation model um, has the context of uh, people's engagement with arts and culture and also their relationship with it as well. So um, I think it's, although it's based on, you know, what people, what people actually do, it also brings in people's um, preferences and um, the, the reasons why they might want to engage with something and the role that it plays in their everyday life um, and the sense of who they are. The important things for me about audience spectrum are that for one thing, it recognises that everybody engages with culture to one level or another. But for some people, it's more accessible. Some people have more opportunity um, to do that. Um, and that lower engagement doesn't necessarily indicate a lower interest. It is simply that some people have more barriers um, in place um, to be able to engage. And it also makes no value judgments about the types of culture that people enjoy or their reasons for um, for engaging with it. Um, so in the pen portraits for each of the segments, um, and we will look at them in a bit more detail in a minute, um, these pen portraits, they're, they're freely available um, online from our website, um, and they go into a lot of detail about each of these individual segments and look at their preferences and their motivations and different ways to reach them where they are. Um, so that's another thing about the, the audience spectrum segmentation is it's geolocatable. So we know where people live, <laughs> which sounds a bit creepy, but it really isn't. <laughs> Um, so it gives you a lot of information about what sort of activities they're likely to be more drawn to. So if you can, you know, if you find that there are significant proportions of a particular segment um, in your area from that information in the area profile report and you know that they aren't people that you're engaging with at the moment um, you can actually you know you can use the the pen portraits to really understand the routes to engaging with those with those particular groups of people um, the segmentation itself is based on some large national data sets, um, including the Taking Part survey, which is where we get that information about how people feel about arts and culture and the value they place on it, um, and also how frequently um, they take part in various activities, including museum visiting. It also draws on um, census data which means that although it's not a demographic segmentation, it does have some underlying demographic information in there. And it can be used alongside um, sort of different monitoring systems as well, like um, so uh, Mosaic, for example, which some local authorities use. It also has some Experian data, which is what drives the mosaic segmentation, which is sort of consumer habits and lifestyle and things like that. And that's all the data that's sucked up every time um, anyone makes any kind of transaction, as far as I can tell. Um, there's a, they have an awful lot of data that sits in there. And essentially all of that comes together and allows us to segment the whole of the UK population into 10 distinct and locatable groups 
based on their preferences, their opportunities and their barriers to cultural engagement. Um, and so we have three highly engaged groups. We have three medium engaged groups and we have four lower engaged groups. Um, and so that's the data sources. Um, and there's also a link there to the pen portrait so that you can look at them in a bit more detail. Um, and now let's have a look at these groups. So we have the three higher engaged groups um, and what they have in common is that um, although they account for a relatively low proportion of the population, um, they account for a, a much higher proportion of audiences so that they are they're overrepresented in almost every art form that you can think of. So these are the people who are doing quite a lot. Um, for all of them, arts and culture play an important part in their lives and their identity. Um, they are very informed and also they, they live within easy reach of a wide offer and lots of opportunity to engage with the different types of arts and culture that they're interested in. But within that, there are differences um, between these three groups. So the Metroculturals, who are the highest engaged group, um, they are a um, very important group for London organisations, um, particularly because 85% of all the Metroculturals in the country live in London, which means they can be significant for South East organisations as well, because they do travel. Um, but both they and the experience seekers, who are the youngest segment, are risk takers. So they're quite experimental in what they're looking for from their cultural engagement. Um, Metroculturals are more drawn to sort of critically acclaimed work um, and organisations with a reputation for presenting, you know, sort of quality um, exhibitions and so on. Experience seekers are looking for more social experiences, so things they can do with their friends, something that's a bit new, new and quirky. Um, so again, even within the higher engaged groups, excuse me, I'm losing my voice, um, there are differences in the way that they engage. Um, community land culture buffs, who are a very important group for the southeast region as a whole, um, they are extremely committed to arts and culture. They have more traditional tastes than the other two highly engaged groups, um, and that makes them a, a key audience for museums and heritage, for example. Um, but they're also very keen supporters of uh, local cultural organisations, and they're the most likely segment to buy original works of art or um, design and, and craft and so on. And they're quite often collectors. Um, and as their name suggests, they live within easy reach of larger towns and cities um, with a wider cultural offer. Um, and they're one of the groups that's been most impacted by COVID. So they are looking for more opportunities closer to home um, as an older group. So that's a sort of snapshot of the higher engaged groups. Um, the three medium engaged groups are closer to a sort of representational level in terms of the population compared to how they appear in, in audience profiles, but they still um, account for, um, they're still higher in the population than they are in the, in the audiences. Um, these groups account for the, the highest proportion of the UK population as a whole. They're generally sort of uh, rural um, and based in uh, suburban towns and small cities right across the country. Um, what they have in common is that they are drawn to more traditional offers. So again, each of these groups in their own way is an important um, audience for, for museums and heritage sites. Um, often there's not a, 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 a wide offer available to them um, close to home. Um, so for some of the groups like the dormitory dependables, they might actually do more than they do at the moment, but they have to travel quite a long way. Um, so they don't have the opportunity to engage as frequently as, as some of the, um, the higher engaged groups. Um, dormitory dependables are also slightly more adventurous than the others. So they can be tempted to try something new if it's somewhere that they feel familiar. So, for example, you know, putting contemporary art in a heritage setting, for example, is something that would would appeal to this group. 
um, they're regular but they're not frequent attenders as I say because they don't really have the opportunity to do more frequently um, and they are um, a group which falls into sort of lower middle age groups um, people who are in early retirement and um, couple lots of, of couples in this group um, so either households that don't have dependent don't have children or don't have dependent children living at home uh, trips and treats is a particularly important segment for museums. Um, they're our family group. Um, their engagement is generally around looking for um, a, a museum or, or some sort of other activity as part of a whole day out. Um, and they tend to do that as uh, sort of special occasions. Um, so a museum visit might make up part of a day out, including shopping and eating out and having time to spend with um, friends and family. Um, home and Heritage are a very traditional um, group. Um, they are one of the oldest segments and, and they made up quite a high proportion of the sort of coach day out day trippers um, pre pandemic. So a lot of museums are missing them from their current attenders because they they're not quite ready to go back to um, that sort of um, uh, visiting, but they will be looking for places um, nearer to home. Um, and there's a high level of uh, National Trust membership um, in this in this group. They sort of look for daytime activities and daytime visiting, which again fits with what some of you are saying about, you know, um, attracting people during the week, for example, uh, dormitory um, uh, home and heritage are, are likely to be a, a good target for that if you have them in your local area. And then the four uh, lower engaged groups. So they are much higher in proportion in the population than in audience profiles, and they are underrepresented in almost all art forms. Um, what they have in common is that they face a, a range of quite significant barriers to engagement. So it might be physical, financial, or um, a lack of confidence or a lack of awareness um, of what's, you know, what the offer is. And I think with, with these groups in particular, when you're thinking about sort of messaging about your offer and what might appeal to them and what might, you know, encourage them to visit, there is... Um, an element of not only not knowing what to expect from the from the visit experience because it's not something that they're familiar with but also not knowing what might be expected of them when they visit so if their families with children and the children are noisy and running around you know is that going to be frowned on are they going to be made to feel uncomfortable by that so um, for these groups they need a lot of information and a lot of reassurance um, and for some of them it may be um, a matter of sort of reaching out to them through uh, trusted voices within their local communities um, to actually to actually bring them in. So community leaders, um, faith groups, libraries are often a really good way to engage with with these groups because we have seen that, that libraries in particular have a very broad reach in terms of the people who use them. Um, so sort of when you're thinking about partnerships, if you do have local library services that you might you might link up with. Um, in terms of the, the, the sort of differences between uh, these groups, um, Up Our Street are mostly um, older couples. They enjoy socialising with uh, friends um, and a lot of what they like doing is sort of based in the home. They do have some quite significant financial um, barriers to, to getting out and about um, and they, they sort of look for things where they're going to be guaranteed uh, a, you know something that's entertaining and fun to do. Um, Facebook families are as their name suggests a family group. Um, they, stand, they tend to use Facebook as a way of staying connected with those friends and family networks um, they are another group which is limited financially and, and many of them rely on public transport, which might be an issue for um, some of you in the, in the areas that you are. Um, very few of them have access to their own um, transport. Um, what they're looking for is a, is a guaranteed offer for the family. So a fun day out. Um, so things you know, that involve live music, outdoor events, those sorts of things. Um, are popular with them because the, the sort of risk factors are reduced. 
kaleidoscope creativity are largely an urban group so i think we would see them uh, perhaps in milton Keynes, for example maybe not in some of the smaller towns and villages um, in this region um, they are one of the most diverse groups in every way that that word can be applied so in terms of their life stage their household groupings um, they have you know there's lots of multi-generational families in this group um, but what they have in common is that they enjoy participatory activities and they although they're lower engaged in terms of their formal engagement through um, uh, particular venues and so on um, they are creative and active in their own communities um, and in their own sort of friend and family networks, um, just not through uh, sort of formal engagement. So again, outdoor events, um, uh, family friendly uh, workshop activities and things like that are likely to um, attract them. Um, heydays are the oldest group um, and they face very significant physical barriers to getting out and about. Um, many of them live in sheltered housing and in care homes and need supported or, or outreach type activities to engage with them. So that might be you know, working in partnership with care providers. It might be you know, arranging minibuses and things like that. Um, and actually, they, they are an example of something which is also important to the segmentation, which is at different life stages, people may have fallen into different groups within the segmentation. So the fact that they are the lowest engaged group is by no means an indication of a lack of interest. At earlier stages of their life, they may well have been one of the more highly engaged groups. It's simply that they don't have the opportunity to engage um, at this point, um, because as I say, it's difficult for them to get out and about. So that's a very quick romp through the um, different levels of the segmentation. Um, all of this information you can get through the uh, online pen portraits that I mentioned. So there's lots of layers of information. I've picked on trips and treats as an example to show you the sort of information that you can get from the pen portraits. So this includes their um, interests, including what they do outside of arts and culture. So, you know, so that you can start to think about what are the interests you might tap into to engage a group. Um, so their preferences in their cultural engagement, what sort of things they like to do, routes to engaging them. So, um, you know, what sort of media they like, what sort of messaging they respond to, where they are geographically. Um, and also there's a statistical download, which you can see here, which shows um, the segment indexed against other groups um, in the segmentation. Um, I'll be sending these different. slides out if you're having trouble seeing them. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. It's just a snapshot to show the different layers of information. <laughs> so some it's of a it's bit small right in there. Into, but... Yes, I wouldn't expect you to be able to read it. Um, but there's, you know, there's maps, there's charts, there's all sorts of information um, about each of the, the segments. And we'll have a look in a bit more detail at some of the segments which are more significant um, for your region now. So let me just oh, press my button. There we go. So in your um, EAPRs, um, the top three segments across um, both areas are community land culture buffs, who are that highly engaged group dormitory dependables, who are medium engaged, and the trips and treats, who are also medium engaged. So um, across both of the, the area profile reports, those same three groups are the most dominant, um, but they are in slightly different proportions for um, Milton Keynes and Buckinghamshire compared to Oxfordshire. So for example, the community land culture buffs account for 28% in Milton Keynes and Bucks and 21% in the Oxfordshire profile. Dormitory dependables are 22% for both areas and trips and treats are 17% in Milton Keynes and Bucks and 16% in Oxfordshire, so quite similar. But um, going back to the importance of looking at 
your um, your local areas, um, there are some significant differences in there. Um, and these are the three that I sort of pulled out that showed very high differences. So Milton Keynes have 32% experience seekers who are that younger group. Um, and when we looked at the demographics, we could see that Milton Keynes does have a, you know, a younger profile than the rest of the, the region. Um, so it's, it's significantly higher. Experience seekers don't even appear in the, you know, the sort of top groups for the region as a whole. But obviously, you know, they account for almost a third of the population in central Milton Keynes. So, you know, your strategies there are likely to be different um, to elsewhere in the, in the area. In, um, I can't remember why, I, does anybody recognize <laughs> Chalfont? I can't remember why it must be related to, to somebody's locate community land culture buffs um, compared to 24%. To so again, that's an older group. Your, your strategies are going to be different for them. Um, and for Didcot, um, you have 34% uh, dormitory dependable, so you know, a higher proportion, and 31% trips and treats. Um, so both of those account for much higher proportions of your local populations than they do in the overall catchment. So again, it's worth looking at those those ward level counts and proportions for these segments as well to determine, you know, if you're thinking about working with your local communities, who those local communities are um, and how you're going to reach them. So uh, very quickly um, look at some of these in more detail. So um, Community land culture buffs, very significant group for audiences and also for support. So there's a high level of individual giving um, and, and volunteering actually in this group um, with their, particularly with their local um, arts and cultural organisations. So they're quite um, reliable uh, prospects if you are thinking about, you know, different revenue streams. Um, they're also um, not averse to paying for um, sort of premium experiences so if you've got you know if you are looking at sort of more ticketed events or something like that that is something that would um, would attract them they are one of the groups that's been worst affected by covid um, they're an older group so most of them are um, in their 70s um, so they've been at higher um, health risk um, from COVID. A quarter of them have a disability or long-term illness, which were added risk factors for them. And um, around a fifth of them have been shielding throughout the pandemic. So they haven't, you know, they're very used to being out and about and doing different things, and they haven't been able to do that for the last 18 months. So it's had quite a high impact on their daily life. Um, and although they're not showing high levels of being ready to return to their pre-pandemic activities, we are seeing that they are doing things closer to home. So if you do have them in your local population, they're definitely a, you know, a group that you might want to target. Um, in line with most of the other segments, one of the key things that they want to know is information about the any safety measures that have been put in place um, so that they feel more comfortable to returning on site. They do have a leaning towards um, heritage and traditional offers. There's high levels of both National Trust and English Heritage membership. Um, so that a lot of them have been returning to sort of visiting um, outdoor heritage sites. Um, and they've been relatively unaffected by the financial implications of COVID. So um, again, it's really sort of getting out and about that has been the main barrier for them. Uh, um, do, 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 do. Experience seekers. Um, so this is a, a, the youngest segment. They're not venue loyal. <laughs> so if you are thinking about cultivating them, um, you, you have to be you have to think about what what you can actually provide, what's sustainable um, for them. So they are they're, they're a sort of core audience for those sort of museum late opening type events where there's music and, and food and drink and opportunities to socialise and things like that. So if you do engage them to keep them coming back, the programme has to be quite dynamic because they are always looking out for the next new thing. Um, but they are a group that you might be able to partner with other organizations um, to to sort of bring them in 
they have been um, at relatively low risk health-wise from COVID, but they have been impacted uh, financially. A lot of them uh, work in the sort of uh, gig industries and um, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, restaurants and bars and things like that. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't... Hospitality, that's the word. Um, so a lot of them working in hospitality. So they've lost um, a lot of income. Um, so they might be a little bit more price conscious than they were pre-pandemic. Um, they, they're willing to take a risk. They engage with lots of different um, arts and cultural activity, um, including sort of performance and things like that. Um, so that's the sort of thing that you might need to think about if you are targeting um, this particular group. They are highly digitally engaged, so that's another route um, to engage with them. And they've been doing, they were already doing a lot pre pandemic and they continue to do uh, quite a lot since. I can see some, are there some questions coming up in the chat? Uh, it's all right, Jackie. Um, it's just the presenter view that we can't quite get sorted today. Um, but ah, I'm going to. Okay. Uh, for everyone, I'm going to send you out the slides, so don't worry if you can't see it on the screen properly. You'll have a copy of it after the session. This is what happened to me last time I went between the EAPRs and the... Let me try. Is that better? Sorry, hey! I, I didn't realise that you'd been... <laughs> you'd been uh, struggling to read with all my notes around it as well. Sorry about that. Anyway, so that's experience seekers. Um, Dormitory dependables, um, as I say, they would probably do more if they had more um, opportunities sitting on their doorstep. Um, they're mature couples and some older families, um, quite a few early retirees. Um, they do have a skew towards an interest in, in heritage and, and sort of mainstream offers. Um, and like the community land culture buffs, they have um, been looking for the sort of early reopening of heritage gardens and things like that post pandemic. Um, there has been some hesitation in returning post COVID, um, but they are looking for opportunities to get out and about in their local areas. So again, they, they're you know, potentially a, a core group um, for you to be looking at in terms of those older people that you might be able to engage during the week, for example. Um, they haven't been particularly hard hit by COVID, either health wise or um, through uh, financial reasons. Um, so they are looking to uh, return to engagement. Trips and treats are the family group um, and really, you know, arts and culture are, are part of uh, an active social life. Um, of getting out and about. So that's something that they've really missed during the pandemic, those opportunities to socialise with friends and family. Um, museums are, are popular for them because they know what to expect. Um, and it's something that they do quite regularly as part of their, their sort of days out. Um, again, they might not be travelling as far as they did uh, pre-pandemic. So they may be looking for more opportunities closer to home. So again, if you've got them on the doorstep, it's, it's worth thinking about the family programming. Um, they haven't been particularly at risk from COVID um, compared to some of the older groups, um, but they have had concerns about outbreaks in schools. They have you know, been hard hit by having uh, children at home and homeschooling for longer. So they have taken some uh, financial uh, hits through the pandemic as well. So they might, again, they might be a little bit more price conscious. In terms of the messaging, they'll be looking for, you know, information about what else there is to do in the area as part of their day out, not just the, the museum offer itself. And uh, Home and Heritage is the group we were just talking about. Um, so they weren't frequent attenders pre-COVID, um, but they do have a preference for heritage and uh, museum offers. They're usually um, found in sort of more rural areas and small towns. So access to um, opportunities to engage are, are generally quite low, which is why they do make up a sort of quite a high proportion of those coach trip um, visitors. Um, so again, they will have been looking for things closer to home. Um, this is another older group. Um, over two thirds of them are 70 plus. 
so they've been more at more risk and almost a third of them have been shielding throughout the pandemic. Um, most of them are retired, so any financial risk has been to their retirement funds rather than um, income. Um, although they are um, sort of generally less active um, than the other medium engaged groups, I think the museum offer has a has a you know a strong appeal to them. So there's definitely something that, that you would be able to do to attract them. And again, they might be those sort of um, midday, midweek visitors that you might be looking for to to sort of um, spread your your uh, visitors across the the whole week. So you're not concentrating only on the sort of family visits at the weekend, for example. Um, and then there's some of the, the lower engaged groups. Um, so up our street, which I, I did note were in some higher proportions in some of the ward, um, wards in these um, area profiles. Um, they're more likely to spend time at home if they have any spare time. Um, they don't have a great deal of leisure time, so they are quite careful about how they use it. Um, but they do like to socialise with their friends and neighbours. Um, they don't tend to have um, family, uh, children living at home, um, so they're not really a, a family group, but the COVID impact has been really high. So they were already um, quite vulnerable in terms of um, their health and also um, economically, and COVID has just really exacerbated the, the issues they were already living with. Um, many of them fall into the older groups, 50 plus, um, and uh, 40 45% of them are living with a long-term health condition. Um, they have um, average or below average income pre-pandemic and many of them worked in the care industry um, and um, so they've been at, at higher risk again. Um, so although there are challenges to engaging with them, um, I think if you do have them in your local communities, you know, um, if you have a sort of free offer, something for them to do during the day, um, that would, you know, that would actually meet a lot of their needs. So, um, again, they will need a lot of information about uh, what to expect from, from a visit, you know, um, what might entice them to, to leave home and actually come out and do something in their, in their local area. Um, Facebook families, a bit more suburban. Um, arts engagement isn't a priority, um, but they are interested in, you know, sort of free things to do uh, with the family. Again, a social offer, different types of activity, outdoor stuff, particularly popular with this group. Um, the economic impacts of COVID have been particularly severe for this group. Um, so they were already vulnerable. Um, but because many of them have children at home, they've had the additional um, impact of, of homeschooling and things like that. So um, the, the, the data that we've seen through uh, COVID has indicated that over a third have all already experienced a reduction in disposable income. And that was before the furlough scheme came to an end. So um, they are a group who will be very price conscious. And as I said before, many of them don't have access to their own transport so they would be looking for you know public transport links um, to, to to make a visit or somewhere that's within walking distance um, so that's a very quick sort of look through um, those different groups sorry i'm aware of time that we're up to 12 o'clock now um, but that's all the sorts of information that you can get through the through the pen portraits um, in terms of what happens next. Um, do you get a sense that this is data that will be useful to you in your day-to-day -day work? Any thoughts on how you might? I think I think the other thing Jackie is which is really useful is you is it it highlights the importance of having a balance of free and paid for activity because it's so easy you know when we're all looking for new sources of income just to focus on the income generators but it reminds me that we've really got to keep a balance. Yeah, and I think that's the key thing really is, is balancing your in your strategy. So, you know, you might focus on one particular group for a strand of activity, but then think about what you might do for those other 
other audiences as well. And that balance is a really nice idea as well in terms of we all want to attract those groups that aren't using us right now. But there's also a flip side of that, we, how we can better serve the groups that do use us. So that's nice. Definitely. I think, yeah. and I think it's going to be really helpful in um, just working out where to, to spend any limited marketing budget. Um, you know, if you know who's there and who's reading, you know, whatever local newspaper or whatever, then it's um, a good opportunity to yeah, target a little bit more carefully. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely helps you um, make best use of the resources that you have um, to make sure you're not trying to aim at people who just aren't there. Um, so brilliant. And always thinking, you know, audience development happens in a in a number of different dimensions. So it might be more of the same sort of people to increase your footfall. It might be deepening the relationships with your existing visitors to sort of turn them into supporters, or it might be reaching out to those those people that you don't see at all um, as an entirely new audience as well. And, you know, your strategy can bring in all of those different things. OK, any last minute questions for Jackie then? Very quiet, that's a good sign. <laughs> There are some hints and tips on things that you might want to think about in the, in the last couple of slides and how to turn all of that data into strategic planning. Um, so um, there's some further information there. And then that's my contact details and all of those further links to lots more information. Should you have time to actually <laughs> delve into all of this, which I'm aware is always is always an issue. But hopefully, you know, you'll, you'll get the slide set and it can remain a, a resource for you to refer to um, as and when you have time to, to, to look at this sort of level of planning. 